Let me take a moment to ask a very fair question. Does anybody actually like the Black Legion? I am sick of all you guys ganging up on me. You guys all think you're so much better than me. Oh, Meg, that is the least fancy thing I have ever heard. When I make the claim that the Iron Warriors are the best traitor legion, you need to really understand what I'm using as my metric here. And in this case, it's how much of a threat they really pose to the Imperium and how much of a nightmare they are to fight against properly. As well as other factors such as their motif, just how cool they are in my opinion because hey it is my channel, as well as other things like logistics and long-term goals. And with all this in mind, yeah, I do believe the Iron Warriors are the best traitor legion. These guys are fucking terrifying. Now before we really dive in, I want to say something. This video is also serving as my 10k subscriber special where I talk about, I guess myself and I guess the reason that the channel exists, what motivated me to make the channel in the first place, and just generally thank you guys, as well as do a fair bit of bitching. The video did kind of get away from me. It was originally just supposed to be about how the Iron Warriors are great, and now it's sort of turned into why I relate to the Iron Warriors on a deeply personal level. So, sorry about that. But before we get into why the Iron Warriors are the best Traitor Legion, let's get into the era before they were a Traitor Legion all the way back to the Great Crusade, and even the Unification Wars. Ever since their inception, the Iron Warriors were used as siege warfare specialists, meant for cracking open the toughest bastions and hardest held positions by the Emperor's remaining enemies on Terra and across the Sol System. You see, because of their remarkably stable gene seed, they saw a large, large number of recruits very early on, becoming one of the biggest and most promising legions, gaining a lot of favor from the Emperor in terms of equipment and battle honors, sometimes being led by the Emperor himself personally. And, much like me, I started out very promising as a child before I started to crater out in high school. Little heads up here, I do tend to relate to the Iron Warriors a lot on a personal level, and not in an edgy teenager, uh, nobody gets me kind of way, in a way that's just genuinely depressing. But more on that later, because now it's off to the races, and by races I mean the Great Crusade proper, you know, after they had secured the soul system. You see, despite being favored very early on, it was not to last because the Iron Warriors would be united with their Primarch fairly late on in the Crusade, and this meant they had really no one to speak for them properly, and as such would end up time and again in those hard, grueling siege campaigns, ones that were incredibly bloody and miserable affairs, but ultimately vital in breaking apart enemy fortifications and strong points. Not things that are particularly noble, no glorious charges or last stands or taking the head of the leader, just crushing the enemy's ability to resupply itself or hold an area. Furthermore, they did so more or less without complaint, because they would be willing to cooperate more than any other legion with normal human military forces. They got a reputation for fighting alongside the common Imperial Army soldiers and having excellent provisions, artillery, fuel lines, logistics out the ass, just everything that a good modern military would have. The ability to annihilate the enemy and a keen sense of favorable odds when going into an engagement. That's called being reasonable. That's called being practical about things. But it still earned them a reputation for being ignoble and inglorious, despite the fact that war and, I don't know, conquering the galaxy is probably going to be both of those things. What matters is winning and getting the job done and working with all the assets you have available, yet they continually got shit for it, despite doing what they were told without complaint. And with just ultimate efficiency. You see, there was one really funny moment that does punctuate this. It's during the first battle of Hydrocordatus, wherein an iron warrior breaches the walls of the fortress, sees the Imperial Fist rallying the soldiers to defend the position and push back the invaders. He takes one look at him and says, No helmet? Idiot. And then just shoots the guy in the face. It's honestly hilarious, but it is really poignant. 
Again, we are ignoring the fact that this Imperial Fist had had a helmet, but it had been destroyed a little while ago. It just illustrates that dry pragmatism that makes the Legion so compelling in comparison to other ones that are manic or vain or hungry for glory and honor, as opposed to just getting the job done. Yes, I am projecting a lot. It's going to be a theme throughout the entire video. It'll make sense at the end, I swear. There's also the caveat that since they didn't have a Primarch to speak for them for most of the Great Crusade, they couldn't really contest orders to deal with the campaigns nobody else wanted to deal with, or breaking up their Legion consistently. You see, the other Legions didn't want to have to leave some troops here or there or there for garrison duty. You know, that thing that's really fucking important when you're placed in charge of newly conquered territories that you don't want to rebel? Yeah, garrison duty. It matters, but they were the ones who had to do it time and time again. To the point where, funnily enough, when they would be reunited with their Primarch, only half of the Legion was present because the other half was basically spread out along the entire galactic front. All of this led to a Legion that was known as the Workhorse, the reliable workhorse of the Legionis Astartes, but was also plagued with an incredibly high casualty rate, to the point where their first name before Iron Warriors was unofficially Corpse Grinders. But it's not just because of their high casualty rate that they gained that name. It was also because of how they would use a lot of the mortal troops in their command later on down the line. Because as things went on, and they were forced into these grueling and unpleasant engagements time and again, they would grow embittered pretty quickly. And you would too. Anybody would. When you see people being lauded and being praised for doing the things you want to do but can't, while nobody listens to you, and you're given shit for doing what you're supposed to do, yeah, you're gonna become bitter and pretty fucking miserable. I would know. But at least they did retain a certain level of appreciation from the other legions and primarchs because of how hard they worked. Until, of course, they didn't. Because there was a specific battle, that being the battle for the Forge World of Incaladian, seeking to bring it into compliance. There, the Iron Warriors would hold to their battle plan even after it had unraveled, refusing to quit the field and incurring disgusting casualties. Now, you would think, hey, that's pretty interesting. Space Marines make valiant last stands and refuse to retreat time and again, and incur some pretty horrible losses. The Imperial Fists are famous for it. Well, the Iron Warriors got a ton of shit for it. They got censured and decried by the other legions for not quitting the field or changing their plan. Yeah, it wasn't the smartest thing to do, but is it really that different from a last stand you could retreat from? No. Of course the old Soviet method isn't the best way to do things, but did they really deserve the level of shit they got for it? No, they didn't. So people in charge of you are gonna build you up to do one specific thing, and do it without question, and you'll do it really damn well until that's no longer the thing they expect of you, without your knowing they will just change their mind that that's no longer what's expected of you, and then get mad at you, and then give you shit and sideline you. It's a fucking nightmare. But don't worry, their Primarch is here now, someone who will hopefully speak for them, someone to give them hope and breathe new life into an effectively broken and disabused Legion. And let me tell you, there's nothing fucking worse than when you think your luck is changing when you think all the shit you've gone through in life is worth it, because now things are going to get better. Someone is here to help. But guess what? Decimation. Yeah, the first thing Perturabo did when receiving command of his new legion was have them draw lots so that one in every ten would be physically beaten to death by the other nine with their bare hands. And you can't really say anything in your own defense about it, because the people doing it, or the person doing it in this case, has so much power over you, and effectively has a gun to your head. So, in the midst of all this bitterness and neglect, is it really any wonder why the Iron Warriors would break with the Imperium at the first chance, and partake in some pretty disgusting massacres along the way? Because believe me, when you have that level of pent-up frustration and bitterness, and it's given an outlet, even if it's a really unfucking healthy one, you take it and you run with it. It's not a good thing, but it certainly is a thing. So, again, it's one of the more understandable reasons for betraying the Imperium. 
I don't know what the hell the Night Lords had going on, they were just crazy from the get-go. The Word Bearers were pretty cool with the whole religion thing, but when it comes to the Iron Warriors, it's just so believable, and dare I say it, relatable to a lot of people. And funnily enough, even during the Heresy, they ended up doing a lot of the heavy lifting, wherein they had to take a lot of campaigns that other people didn't want to, like enacting the dark compliances that Horus did across sections of the galaxy, as well as, as per usual, breaking down loyalist strongholds like Hydrocordatus. Not to mention being used and screwed over by the Emperor's children inside the Eye of Terror and effectively left for dead, having to plunge into a fucking black hole in order to get out alive. All this really does make that final moment when they truly went their own way and just said fuck it, to be so triumphant. For those who don't know, during the Siege of Terra, the Emperor's children and the World Eaters and even the Death Guard were all doing their own thing, pursuing personal agendas or just going nuts, while the Iron Warriors actually committed to breaking down Dorne's defenses in the Imperial Palace, really putting themselves on the line to do that, going so far as to take several spaceports at great cost. And, generally speaking, Perturabo was the one who organized both the Solar War and most of the siege itself. And what was his payment for all this? Being told by Horus, not personally but through his equerry, that, hey, leave the command station and just disperse your troops amongst the front line, we're giving Mortarian command of the siege. Mortarian. And when they finally, for the first time, stand up for themselves and say, actually, fuck this, we're leaving, it really meant a lot to me, honestly, in a way. I know it's gonna sound cringe and edgy, but I think it's clear I see myself quite a bit in the Iron Warriors, so seeing them actually take that step and just go, I really was cheering them on in that moment. And ultimately, the side they dipped out on lost the war. So, when things finally ended and the dust settled after the Great Scouring, they were the largest and most intact of the Traitor Legions, as well as one of the only ones to retain their old command structure and general cohesion. That's actually commented on in the book Lords of Silence, wherein it stated the Death Guard, Word Bearers, and Iron Warriors are the three legions to stick together and are therefore some of the most dangerous, and funnily enough, are some of the ones at least present in the Black Legion. Now, getting into why I call the Iron Warriors even now the best traitor legion, let's look at who their comparison is. World Eaters, broken. Emperor's Children, broken. Night Lords, broken. Sons of Horus, defunct and rebranded. Thousand Sons, barely existent with tiny numbers. Alpha Legion, not even fully traitor. And again, very fractitious. Only the Death Guard and the Word Bearers come close. I would call the Word Bearers the second best because the Death Guard, again, numbers not great, but just more or less cohesive and very hard to kill. Oh, and did you look at that? Most of the Word Bearers also were not present for the Siege of Terra. They dipped out beforehand. Some people would immediately think in a knee-jerk reaction, oh, the Black Legion is the biggest threat to the Imperium because it's large and because of all 13 Black Crusades. Look at the state of the galaxy. Well, consider that the only reason the Black Legion exists is to take down and make war on the Imperium, as opposed to just doing their own thing and pursuing their own personal goals, it really shouldn't take them 10,000 years to start seeing some real progress. And even then, it almost seems like a luck shot. The Iron Warriors, though, for their part, are one of the biggest traitor legions. The reason for this is because they make a pretty concerted effort to replenish and rebuild their numbers. A word bearer is a word bearer, a death guard is a death guard. That doesn't really change. The Iron Warriors, though, continually set a goal to obtain more gene seed. They go out of their way to hunt for it and produce new space marines with it. Now, these new space marines are considered to be quote-unquote half-breeds and are not really seen in the same equal footing as old heresy veterans. But the Iron Warriors, despite that little bit of prejudice, are pretty damn meritocratic. The best example of this comes from the character of Honsu. You see, Honsu is not from the heresy. His gene seed comes from an Iron Warrior's apothecary murdered by Fabius Bile named Honorable Solaka. But 
Fabius Bile's gene samples were destroyed in a fire in his lab, and only one survived. But the case with it was damaged, where most of the name was gone, and it just said Han Su. H O N S O U. Now, Han Su has his gene seed mixed with both Iron Warrior and Imperial Fist. You would assume this combination would make him some abomination to the other Iron Warriors, that he would be shunned or even just straight up killed. But no, he does really well for himself. Despite that half breed status, he shoots up through the ranks because of his savvy, his charisma, and his general capabilities as a leader of men, to the point where he is a captain under the warsmith Barban Falk. That's another thing about the Iron Warriors. They still maintain that rank of warsmith for people who have that ability to lead and control large groups in a combat setting for the greater goals of the Legion, or more independently, as opposed to other Legions where people get their spot by the arbitrary and fickle favor of the Dark Gods. And when Barban Falk disappears into the warp after ascending to demonhood, he hands over command of his warriors to Hansu, because he had proven himself in battle and had earned Barban Falk's respect and favor ahead of two other marine captains, that being Forex and Kroger, both of whom were fellow Triarchs. Triarchs to Perturabo during the end of the heresy. Triarchs being Perturabo's personal advisors and the de facto heads of the Legion right underneath the Primarch. This all happened during the second siege of Hydrocordatus, and granted, both Forex and Kroger had died during the siege, but even before they did, it was pretty clear who was favored by Barb and Falk. The Gene Seed Imperial Fist hybrid who worked his way up. This gives the Iron Warriors what is arguably one of the best officer and leadership cores of any Legion. Even in the Word Bearers, we see people bumble and fall to incompetence because they feel like their title should be respected more, or no, I have more favor of the gods, no, I have more favor of the gods, and keep squirming behind each other's backs. Now make no mistake, this does happen in the Iron Warriors Legion, because a traitor is a traitor, they're not pleasant people. But it does happen significantly less, and winning is what's paramount. They do not start squabbling with each other in the middle of a battle. They will explicitly wait until after the fact to start taking out grudges on each other, and it all happens within the context of the Legion. Things stay internecine as opposed to tearing the Legion apart, and if there's an outside threat, they will all close ranks. A good example of this is when Hansu kills a rival of his named Barossus, a dreadnought again from the Heresy era. They had actually come to blows over the fact that Hansu was allegedly hoarding gene seed that they had won during the battle, most of which was given to Abaddon the Despoiler because he had asked this of them. Yeah, that's a thing to remember. Abaddon has to directly petition aid from Iron Warriors who are not part of the Black Legion. He literally has to basically take out loans from these guys for heavy equipment, logistics, and troops. Perturabo himself signs off on these things and will occasionally aid Abaddon, but he is never subservient. The Iron Warriors are never really controlled by anyone other than their own Legion command staff and Perturabo himself. They maintain independence and seek alliances where it suits them. Hansu is a great example of this, because after killing Barossus and claiming victory, he sets about putting that gene seed to work in various projects to make more marines, something the Iron Warriors do pretty damn consistently, it's why they have such good numbers. Now, when people think about Iron Warriors being made, they think about the Demon Kulaba. Which, here's the thing, I know it's disgusting, I know everybody shudders and it's just passed around as a meme, but the Demon Kulaba is actually kind of ingenious, and the Iron Warriors got some pretty damn good marines out of it. We can talk about the unfleshed and just how gross it was, but it was a pretty horrible and pragmatic way of replenishing numbers for an invaluable resource. Chaos Space Marines, empowered by the warp, but loyal to the Iron Warriors. No other Legion shows this level of engineering or logistical acumen with regards to their numbers or this level of just dark genius, if I'm being honest. 
yeah, they'll go into battle and they'll kill people and they do what they do, but nobody hits this level. I don't even think the Alpha Legion hits this level. The closest thing they do is poaching promising recruits from training academies to make them into Alpha Legion Marines. But again, they just don't do as much with it because they don't have the muscle to back it up. But the Iron Warriors sure as hell do. The best example comes, once again, from the second siege of Hydrocordatus. See, you know what a Night Lord would do in this situation? They're gonna try to infiltrate the fortress and start killing defenders left, right, and center, skinning them alive and woo, look how awful it is, look how scary. Or if it's a world eater, they're gonna rush in headlong and just try to basically scream their way through the walls and it's probably not gonna work, let's be honest. Because there's protocol for these things. You can ascertain what you ought to do in the Codex or just with your own warrior's intuition, especially since the defenders were an entire company of Imperial Fists. What did the Iron Warriors bring to the table? A Tyranid. Not just any Tyranid, a whole Tyranid bioship that they fucking kidnapped. Yeah, these guys stole a Tyranid bioship. Those shits are two kilometers long, by the way. That's larger than a light cruiser, you know, like a medium to small starship, and severed it from the hive mind, while presumably sending pictures of the thing wearing a blindfold back to the hive mind's mother or something, and pumped it full of the fucking obliterator virus. For those who don't know, the obliterator virus is a manufactured plague that causes the body to absorb weaponry and become obsessed with heavy weaponry and just destruction. It just turns you into a berserker made of guns and slapped in a bunch of chaos mutations to make the thing warp capable. Yeah, they use this thing to deploy super heavy weapons and Imperator class titans to the battlefield as well as just a general mobile assault platform. What do you fucking do against that? What's the protocol there? Please, scan the codex and tell me, what do we do in this exact situation? Like, in the comments, top of your head, what is plan A for that shit when you are defending a position from a fortress? You see a Tyranid bioship just start shitting out titans, and it's just looking at you. And I want to reiterate, the defenders lost the second siege of Hydrocordatus. <laughs> you know who did survive? One fucking guardsman. That's it. One guardsman survived the entire siege out of thousands. That's what you do against this kind of firepower. That's what you do against the Iron Warriors. You lose. You just fucking lose. Now, with regard to some of the more current lore regarding the Iron Warriors in the 41st and 42nd millennium, we can see that they still have a lot of that old vigor and independence to them. A complement of Iron Warriors are handed over to Vashtor to aid with his assault on the rock. Something I was right about, by the way. In one of my earliest videos, The Future of Vashtor, I theorized that Vashtor seems like someone who would get along with the Iron Warriors really fucking well. Because Vashtor is the lord of the Forge of Souls, that being a neutral warp area where things like demon engines and maulers and even sort of semi-cybernetic, semi-demonic mutations and gifts are granted and made from. The people who know how to access the Forge of Souls and utilize it are called Warpsmiths. And this should not come as a surprise, but most Warpsmiths are Iron Warriors. And guess what Abaddon has to do, but go to the Forge of Souls and basically beg and petition for supplies from these Iron Warrior Warpsmiths. They're really on top of their game. They're doing really fucking well, and honestly one of the few traitor legions to be doing better than they were during the Heresy. And you know what? I love it. They're great villains, they're excellent antagonists, and it's honestly a shame we don't see them used more in the lore. But with the Arcs of Omen, we have seen a bit of a resurgence, and hey, I love it. Now, I should attest, a lot of this attachment does sort of stem from a personal, I guess, connection I feel to the whole Iron Warrior thing. I guess I made that pretty clear earlier on in the video, but let me take a moment to get a little deeper into it and go into some of my own personal problems in life story. Hey, I did just hit 10k subscribers, thank you so much guys, so I guess we'll call this a bit of a special, letting you guys into the world of Chrono. Ever since I was a little kid, 
I always found myself subjected to rules and expectations that were far in excess of other little kids. I was always seen as the smartest one in the class, and that entailed only ever bad things for me. Specifically, I, like many other Asian kids, was told, oh, you can be whatever you want growing up, but realistically it was very heavily implied that they would only be happy with a doctor or an engineer, they being my parents. Now, this is something a lot of people in my position complain about ad nauseum, but the problem is when they try to ensure it. That being, by imposing a lot of very restrictive rules that alienate you from everyone else around you. I could never, until very late in my life, go to someone else's house, or do anything, or go out with friends anywhere. I was always kept separate from everyone. I always had to be very, very careful whenever I interacted with anyone who was a girl, because being Hindu, the expectation of arranged marriage is very, very prevalent and very heavily enforced, to the point where female friends were never a thing. And furthermore, just being anywhere that a girl might be outside of school was completely prohibited out of my parents' fear that I would get bewitched and stolen away from the family in my later years, or fall into some quote-unquote de debauched and undisciplined behavior. And this was coupled with the whole drinking thing. My parents were terrified of drinking and anything relating to alcohol. Note, we're not Muslim. There were other Hindu kids who were even of the same caste of Hinduism, Brahmin, as myself. So they could drink and lead more or less normal lives, but I couldn't. It was this heavily drilled in thing, and it was accompanied all of it with this constant brainwashing that everyone around me is trying to set me up to fail and is themselves doomed to failure while I am not. One thing I heard a few times as a kid was, success comes at any cost. This was drilled into me. These rules and restrictions were drilled into me with the caveat that I was going to do better than everyone else around me. They were all going to fail, I would rise above them, I would do great, everyone else was doomed, and that this would all go somewhere. Whatever misery or unpleasantness I was dealing with now or alienation would be worth it in the end when I had a great life down the line. So, like an iron warrior, I accepted that I will hold this more unpleasant role, eschewing connections and the memories that other people were making, as well as the emotional development they were getting, in favor of a promise that down the line things would be better. And, like an iron warrior, it became pretty clear to me around later high school that I had been lied to. It became apparent that all these things the other kids were doing, having petty little relationships, going out, being able to take the bus on their own, going places, forging memories, going to parties, and having sleepovers, and birthday parties, and generally just having people to play with, and being able to spend time with each other, was very integral to their development and integration as well as their emotional maturity. These were things I realized I was lacking on. This was a situation that I, for lack of a better word, could not unfuck. It even became a running joke almost like the fucking corpse grinder thing, about how, oh, Chrono never had a childhood, Chrono never had a teenhood, and then when it came to like parties or social events people would go to, oh, uh, Chrono was there, he was just in another room. People had to literally make a joke out of it to make sure they didn't forget I fucking existed. And when this hits you, when you realize just how fucking alone you are and screwed you are, you start to get depressed. And it makes it hard to focus on school. Your grades start to tank, you just close in and become miserable. My entire reputation throughout high school was the guy who is miserable, and the guy whose home life fucking sucks. That is the entirety of what I was known for. Not the fact that I was a theater kid, not the fact that my grades were good, not any particular thing, just that. Because I couldn't develop anything about myself outside of that. And, well, you know how Iron Warriors have this really shit relationship with their Primarch? Yeah, anyone who's been following my channel for any period of time knows what I'm about to get into, that being my relationship with my parents. For lack of a better word, it sucked. And you can't use the excuse that, oh, my parents thought they were just doing what was best for me by excluding me and tearing me away from basically all of society. They were awful, especially my dad. I would always find myself mocked or belittled or pestered in some way. 
even now that I'm out of high school, it happens, I think, more than ever. Or maybe I'm just more cognizant of it. There are times when my dad has humiliated me in front of the family just so he can get a laugh in where he has kept bothering me and pestering me and then admitted, I just like bothering you too much. Or times when he has just snapped and started yelling at me and insulting me saying I'm gonna go nowhere in life just because I couldn't understand his shitty unclear instructions. And yeah, sometimes he'll admit he's wrong after the fact, but barely ever. And if you ever disagree with the guy, he just goes silent and gives you the cold shoulder and just goes, well, I didn't say anything. I haven't said anything. Why are you getting upset at me? Despite the fact that it's very clear he is heavily projecting his emotions and just generally being super unpleasant. And I know it doesn't sound like a lot because it's really hard to put into words how this man can bring you to tears just because you some way defied his ego or his self-image or just his general need to always be right and in charge and at the top of things. And he will raise his voice if he feels slighted enough. And he would never hit me, but he was not above hitting my sister when she fucked up enough because she was more of a rebel. She would try to push back and that would get her in shit every single time. But that still did have an effect on me because I always knew that if I fuck up hard enough, that will be me on the floor with my dad with his one boot on my feet and then hitting me with his bald fist. Or there was another time where my mom had my sister pinned to the bed and was hitting her. And then she looked over at me and told me, close the door. So I had to back out of the room and close the door and listen to her beat my sister. And for anyone who's about to say that I should be showing more slack and sympathy to my sister, who arguably had it worse from my parents, you need to understand what my sister would do to me. Because she recognized that I was the quote unquote favorite. I wasn't the favorite, I just wasn't stupid enough to get in my parents' way and piss them off constantly. And this meant she would take out all her frustrations on me. Every single thing I ever said, because we would be alone together most of the day, would be met with an insult or some kind of derision or her just not wanting to listen and not wanting to hear it. She had complete control or her hitting me. She would hit me a lot and throw things at me and just constantly degrade me or any interests I had. I was never nurtured or protected. There was never that sibling camaraderie. There was only ever fear. She would actually chase me into the bathroom in the tiny little apartment we grew up in. We did grow up in a very, very unaffluent area, even though my family would make a lot of money later down the road, just so I could hide there to avoid a beating. And one time I actually retaliated by spraying her with Windex through a crack in the door, and then I got in so much trouble with my mom because I had effectively nearly given her chemical burns, because my mom decided to ignore the fact that I was trying to defend myself. My parents knew what she was doing to me, they just never stepped in, and if I ever hit back, I would get in trouble because she was a girl, even though she was three years older than me. And the things she would say to me are unspeakable. She would actually say that she was gonna get a big black guys with giant dicks to come and rape me up the ass or when I would rub my hands together quickly, which I would later find out would be a form of autistic stimming, she would say, what, is that you and your gay boyfriend's dicks flopping against each other? Things like this. And it really messed me up. It wasn't just that all of these things were happening, it was that I was never man enough to retaliate. See, the reason the younger sibling always gets quote-unquote better treatment according to older siblings is because as the youngest, you are the most vulnerable. You need to be protected. You need to be guided. And I simply was not. You need to understand I had nothing going on in my life aside from school and home, school and home, school and home. So there was no break from this. It was just this horrible grind forward in these disgusting conditions that I simply put did not deserve to be put through. And I put up with it with the idea that there would be something good later on down the line, only for things to get even worse when I finally graduated high school. Again, this does kind of sound much like the Iron Warrior situation. They put up with these awful battles and conditions and mistreatment by the other legions and the other primarchs, hoping that one day things would get better and that they would be justly recognized. That never happened. I began realizing something was wrong around 7th grade, wherein a bunch of kids were playing baseball with a giant comically red uh, bat, like made of plastic, and I wanted to use it, I wanted to take a swing, but they wouldn't let me because they didn't know who I was. And while they knew who I was, they just didn't know me well enough. I wasn't part of the in-group, even though I was in their class. I actually started crying because of that, and my dad carried me away and made fun of me for it to my face. And then, it just kept getting worse throughout all the way till the end of high school, where things started to get a little better. I started to be given a little freedom because I had impressed my parents with a really good graduation speech and 
a bunch of other shit. But it was after that summer, the summer after graduation, where my life really came to a screaming halt. You see, as previously stated, my family is extremely against alcohol. But at a friend's house once, one of those few times I could go, we started doing shots. I ended up overdoing it and then ended up passing out in the street, apparently. And the last thing I remember, well, the first thing I remember was my eyes closed, sitting down, and then hearing my mother's voice, he's waking up. And even in my drunken haze, I immediately knew this is it. This is how I end. Because I knew I'm going to get in trouble. This is going to ruin and end my life, basically. And it's going to lead up to me eventually committing suicide because of this moment. I was that sure of it even through my drunken haze at like 2 in the morning. I woke up, my parents were furious with me, they told me I could never see my friends again, and that I would never be allowed to have friends again. That was the caveat. No communication with other people, never having friends again. It's near impossible to overstate the negative effects of something like that on someone, especially at the age of 18. That you will be alone for the rest of your life, you will never be close to people, you'll never see these people who were once your friends who you had actually established connections with, like the only people I really knew outside of my awful home life. This would continue for 10 and a half months until I eventually talked my parents out of it. And even by then, it was too late. I tried to reconnect with my friends, we all really tried, but we just couldn't. As the years wore on, they moved on with their lives and did more and more things that I could not relate to while I stayed still. They started making new friends and going to places like Cancun or the Dominican Republic together and just going places I couldn't follow. On those rare occasions we did actually meet up and go to someone's house, we couldn't do anything like go to a bar or go to a club or anything, it would just be us sitting in someone's house because there was nothing else I could do. And there was such a gap between us. They would talk about things and people and places that I had no context for. At this point, our only commonality is from 9 to 10 years ago. Out of the entire friend group, I was one of the three founding members, but now I'm not even an extra. I'm literally non-existent. They even actually admitted to having a group chat without me where they could make plans without feeling guilty that they're doing so in front of me who will not be able to come. No one to speak for me, no one to really give consideration to me or what I'm going through or to make sure that I'm having fun or having a good experience or being recognized, just suffering and toiling with the vague promise that it's for the best even though I know now that it's not. Throughout all my years of university, I'm going into my ninth year of university because of career path changes and general depression making it hard to move forward and keep, you know, scoring and just doing well, I actually never once made a single friend. Because even if people would talk to me, or even when girls would ask me out, it never went anywhere because I could never follow up. Like, people would talk to me briefly, maybe invite me to a house party, and then I wouldn't be able to go, and then they would just stop talking to me, and it happened, like, every other year. And eventually, you just kind of fade into the background. So I was left alone and unspoken for, like an iron warrior, to hammer out this difficult and unpleasant task, with the hope that eventually I will one day win. And the ultimate fact of the matter is, I know exactly who to fucking blame. Despite idiots telling me, why don't you just punch your dad in the face? Why don't you just walk out and leave and get a job at Walmart? It's that easy, you're over 18. No, it's not that easy. And instead of like so many others in my situation, and even in my family, I could have just fallen in line and marched to the beat of their drum, but I'm not going to. And the reason why is because I'm angry. Herein lies the virtue of vengeance in the way an Iron Warrior would see it and in the way I feel it. Because that anger and that desire to get back at this family that stabbed me in the back when I needed the most and was at my most vulnerable, being the youngest, is what drives me forward and motivates me to just not ever fucking quit. Like, even when I hit those points where I'm depressed and I feel maybe I should just give up and just fall in line and just accept my fate, no, because I remember what has been said to me. Not words of encouragement or the power of friendship, but every fucking insult, every denied opportunity, every time I was laughed at and like humiliated and just made to be emasculated and feel small. And it just angers me so much. I will like, I'll be said one thing, one thing my family will say to me 
uh, in like the middle of the day and then my I will physically start trembling with anger. My teeth will clench so hard that they'll slip off each other and then I need to manually feel to make sure I didn't chip something. My heart rate will start to surge and I will physically start shaking because of how angry I get at these people and at the injustice of it all. Now, it's not the anger of a world eater. It's not like I just lash out and start screaming and throwing things like, you know, or anything like that. It's directed anger. The same kind of anger you can see in Iron Warrior characters like Perturabo and others. The ones who are so angry at their situation and everything that happened, but have the ability to direct that anger. To use it as a weapon and focus on a singular point and exert pressure with that anger until they just win. That's what I'm doing. Every time I study German in secret, or look at German immigration law, or sit and plan and hope and grind working on this channel so that I have people who can see me when my moment of triumph finally approaches probably two or more years from now when I'm like 28 or 29. It is all because I am so angry and I just refuse to lose to these people. I refuse to lose to everyone who has doubted me, or diminished me, or abused me, or mistreated me in any way. It is that anger that has kept me alive. And for some people, like me, that's just how it is. Vengeance and the desire to get back at people is how we wake up in the morning and justify our continued existence. Some of us find happiness as a way of revenge. Every single success or smile we gain is us striking back at those who denied us that exact thing. You might not think it's healthy, but if it works, it works. Now, you see people on Twitter draw these long elaborate comics about how they rose from the ashes like some majestic phoenix and overcame abuse and learned how to smile and be happy and how everything's great and healthy, yada yada yada. It's not like that for a lot of us. A lot of us are going to just scrabble in the dirt until the day we die and claw our way forward inch by bloody fucking inch. You know the reason people who just lose their temper constantly are fucking losers for? Is because they do not have it in them to direct their anger and their desire for vengeance and instead just slobber all over themselves and those around them. They are not iron within or iron without. But we are. People, you who's listening to this, who hears yourself in my voice and understands the situation I'm in because you're somewhere similar. You have that in you too. The power to direct your anger and your desire to get back at those who have hurt you into something great, into a forward motion that will let you bowl over obstacles and eventually stand triumphant when all those obstacles are just gone. Because you outlasted them. This is the virtue of vengeance as an iron warrior and as we understand it. Not heady abstractions about suddenly being the bigger person or forgiving and forgetting. The power to look in the eye those who have doubted you and harmed you so and say, as God is my witness, I will not let you win. I will still be here even after you're gone and I will be happy and I will be strong and triumphant. I am by no means a perfect person. I have done and said some dumb fucking things and have hurt and wronged people in my life. I don't uh, intend to like make that seem unclear or deny that. I have, I've been not the greatest person in the world, but all things considered, I think I'm doing well enough because of where I've come from and what I've had to deal with, even if that might be a little arrogant to say. I have survived a hell of a lot and suffered a lot in my life. That's something everyone who really knows me can attest to. And now, in my 26th year of life, with you guys at my back, with all these subscribers and the people who have shown me support, I finally feel the tide changing. The walls are beginning to break and soon I will storm the citadel and find my happiness that has been hidden away inside. I have been in a siege my entire life waiting for the enemy to break so that I can finally get what is mine locked inside those great walls. And I think a lot of people in my situation gain a bit of a sense of satisfaction and even pride in what we have endured, showing just th what we're really made of as people. It's the iron in your blood, and that knowledge of where you've been and what you've survived does give you strength. Knowing how strong you are helps give you the willpower to just keep going and believe in yourself. And when you can believe in yourself, you find honor in your own success and your own ability to just keep going forward. And when you keep going forward, again, that 
struggle and that pride in yourself from what you've endured continues and just keeps folding in on itself. From iron cometh strength, from strength cometh will, from will cometh faith, from faith cometh honor, from honor cometh iron. This is the unbreakable litany, may it forever be so. That's what that really means. I often find it funny, my dad expects me to sing and dance and be upbeat and happy, despite the fact that my entire childhood, that notion and that sort of desire to be that way was effectively ripped out of me by the sheer amount of control and misery I was subjected to, and now that I'm accustomed to staying inside and being quiet, my dad is trying to drag me out of my comfort zone and make me an outgoing person because now he sees the merit of it, just like for his own gain. He's actually grooming me, you know, to go into business with him and just spend the rest of my life at his side, or the rest of his life, I should say, and get into the family business, do real estate like him, do business like him, just pile on more and more money like him, even though that's not what I want. I don't want to be around him for the rest of my life working with him. I, I genuinely hate the guy. I'm sorry to say that. No son should have to say that, but I do. He actually wants me to start a YouTube channel, but I don't tell him about this one because I know He'll question everything. He's made fun of me for actually looking at Warhammer stuff on Google one time. And if I make a channel that he can see and that he knows about, he'll nitpick everything and just never leave me alone about it. Like, I want to get out of here. I want to move to Germany. I want to learn French cooking. I want to speak German. I want to see Europe. I want to learn how to ride a motorcycle, a Royal Enfield classic to be specific, and just drive that shit through the Black Forest in Germany. I want to get back into stage theater. I want to learn how to play a metal resonator guitar and play music for money on the side of the road, you know, busking. And I want to maybe even learn how to read fucking tarot cards and do readings for people with all that showmanship and mysticism and whatnot. And just do everything I can to make my life as interesting as possible. I want to have friends again in real life. I want to enjoy the common light and air that other people do. I want to exercise and get into shape so I can feel strong on the outside in the way I feel strong on the inside. There's so many things I want to do, and if there's one regret I have, it's that I'm going to be like 30 by the time I'm out of here, and I'll have lost basically most of the quote-unquote best years of my life. I'll probably never have a wife or marry, because if I have kids and get married, that'll just pin me down and slow me down, and I won't really be able to make up for all the time that was taken from me, you know? But hey, I guess we all have to make sacrifices. And for the first time in my life, I feel like I'm actually gaining something. I feel like I'm finally moving forward in my life and accomplishing something, and it is all thanks to you guys. It is all thanks to every single one of you who has subscribed to this channel and watches these videos and shows me support and helps me feel like I do in fact exist. That even though I am stuck in this endless siege that has been my life, I'm still going to win. I'm not truly alone in the trenches, and that one day I will win. Even if it's two years from now or ten years from now, I will win and I will have my revenge. Because there is virtue in vengeance. With that, I'm gonna cap off this video here. I'm so sorry it has ran so long, guys. Thank you for anyone who has stuck around to hear me babble and whinge. And thank you for everyone who has ever shown me support with this channel. And fuck you to everyone who has not. <laughs> Let's see if we can hit 20,000 subscribers by the end of this year. I know that's a little bit ambitious. That's about... 9,000 subscribers in five months. For me and someone who grows as, um, at the rate I do, that's, that's ambitious. So let's see if we can do it. Let's go. Iron within, iron without everybody.